So first of all, like everyone else, thank you, Matt, for and the um, organizing committee for putting together a really amazing uh, conference so far. This meeting definitely learned a lot. It was great seeing old friends, meeting new friends, and I think everyone has. <coughs> oh, good. Yeah, you can see much better if I go over this way. I can see it better, um, and I think you're going to hear the same thing as most of the the. the talks before in terms of it's complicated and we need more um, research. So I don't have that many disclosures except I'll say that a lot of the work um, that I've done is by a great team. Um, I haven't taken any um, consultant fees as yet, even though I've been in this field a long time, and I might change that just because everybody's making a hell of a lot of money, it seems, uh, so I, I need to join that group. But I will present on some work with the product from GW Pharmaceuticals. So we have a wonder drug, right? And this wonder drug is actually this opium. And this opium plant has been around for thousands of years. We know from a lot of the work that um, even in China, the Chinese surgeons, not only the cannabis, they actually use opium for surgery. Um, in the 1527 or so, the Swiss-German um, alchemist, he then introduced opium pills for medicine. In the 1800s, morphine was isolated from opium. And of course, it was the god of dreams. The US started realizing the problem with opium, and in fact, morphine, in the 19th century. And I found it really interesting. You know, It was like used for everything, right? For pain, anxiety, respiratory problems, consumption, and women's ailments. They always say women's ailments, which I, you know, it's always. But a fascinating thing in this, in this period was, for example, Dr. Stevens. Dr. Stevens in Ohio, he cured in 10 to 20 days 30,000 people with an opium morphine uh, addiction. I want to know what he used. But it's, it tells you the degree to which there was a problem even back then, 30,000. So because of that, um, well, actually, then they synthesized heroin. So Bayer, and it was a cough suppressant, and it was put in you know, children's medicine. Um, and it was said to be non-addictive because this wonder drug. But as I said, they then started realizing all of the challenges that was coming out. So they started putting together all of the, the policies of these, these acts to then prevent, to make it illegal to use heroin for medicine. The, then in 1916, um, oxycodone was synthesized. And in around 1997, Purdue Pharma the oxycodone, they then start to promote this a lot for the treatment of chronic pain, despite not that much data on its usefulness for that. So all of that has contributed to our current opioid crisis. And the opioid crisis in large part is because the opioids impact on the respiratory centers. And the opioid prescription medications, if you look in Canada, there's a significant relationship between opioid prescribing rates and opioid related mortality. These are the number of people who have died in the different provinces here in, in Canada, but it's am amazing that I think Canada did not look at what happened in the US that brought us this opioid crisis because in the US we have about 120 people who die every day from an opioid overdose. So a number of years ago, uh, 2016 I guess, I did a calculation of how many people had died in different wars and, or military um, conflicts that the US was involved with from about the, you know, World War II, uh, from 1941, and drug overdoses for the past 15 years. And more people have died of drug overdoses than have died in any war, the combined wars and conflicts of the United States. And if you add over 70,000 people died last year, so and in 2017 it was about 50,000. So if you add about 120,000 people more, 
to that number I have there's over 700,000 people have died, yet so we do not have people in the streets yelling and making a huge issue that we have an epidemic. So that Canada has watched us go from this. And as I showed you the numbers in Canada, in the US we know that most of the people who started, who are now um, abusing heroin, started off misusing opiate prescription drugs. So I don't know what the numbers are, probably someone can tell me for Canada, but we still, even though there's been a lot of work to educate physicians about using or prescribing um, opioids for chronic pain, there's still more opioid um, prescriptions written than the adult population in the US. So, but for, I'm talking about overdoses, but it's critical to realize that for everybody that dies, there's a lot of other numbers of the people who are surviving with this opioid use disorder that hits the emergency departments, that hit all of our clinical programs, and it's a humongous clinical burden. So all the estimates shows that opioid abuse costs more than three times to treat than other medical disorders. I am the director of the Addiction Institute at Mount Sinai, and we have over 6,000 people who are in, who are, or in our, who have opioid use disorder, and over 10,000 people with chronic pain that we, we try to treat. So we have to come up with a lot of solutions for the, the, the clinical burden that's there. And the opioid the medications or the treatments for opioid use disorders are opioid medications themselves, such as methadone that's been around for about 50 years, um, buprenorphine, suboxone, naltrexone is the, the antagonist. But for the most part, we and most people in the US treat with the opioid agonist. And I want to say, at the end of the day, no matter what people might say about the opioid agonists, they have kept millions of people alive. We know that for people who are not on the opioid medications, they have a huge risk of overdose. So they are an evidence-based treatment that should be used. And unfortunately, only about 20% of people in the US actually get treatment for their opiate use disorder. I think that's egregious, and it's something that, you know, 2019, Western civilized um, societies that we have medications, no medication is ideal. We can't not provide treatments for people when, when we do know that these things do work. So what are the barriers? I mean, a large amount of the barriers relate to stigma. You know, people are told, don't use an opioid because, you know, um, to treat your addict, that word addict people use, you brought this on yourself, moral failings. Also, the government regulation of tr treating with opioid agonists is tremendous. So for everybody who um, comes in with methadone, we have to watch them, you know, consume their methadone. Things like that are ridiculous for buprenorphine. Physicians have to be trained have to be waived, have to go to these classes. And so very few physicians in the US, actually about two to 3% are even waived to prescribe buprenorphine. Again, um, really bad. And you know, trying to get science-based novel treatments are some of the things that um, are some of the barriers. So for us, although we have medications where the evidence shows it works, having opioids only as their main um, treatment is, as I said, challenging. So it's like, what are some of the alternative strategies? And that's where cannabis kind of came to, to me. Not, I was, I'm going to show you my path to this, but we talk a lot about, and many people from yesterday, you know, we know that cannabis has over, you know, 500 chemicals, over 140 of them now are known to be cannabinoids, and we, we talk mainly about THC and CBD. So, are these alternative treatments. The, one of the issues that we have with people thinking cannabis in general is a treatment is the, the fact that we have this increase in THC concentration in the cannabis plant on, on the streets today. And you know, so when people say, oh, I can just smoke marijuana, it's very challenging because we are comparing often to times uh, in the, even in the early, uh, 20s, 
20, 2001 or so on, I don't know how to say early 20s, um, where THC levels were pretty um, much lower, especially compared to the CBD um, concentration. This number is crazy because the new numbers came out. I mean, you look, the, the THC to CBD concentration is crazy. So there's so much THC to CBD in the plants on the streets today. And for us, the question is about addiction. And for me in particular, it, aspects of influencing the developing brain and psychosis and so on. So the, the epidemiological data definitely shows that the earlier you start with marijuana, um, the more frequent you use uh, marijuana. And I say marijuana just because a lot of the, the studies earlier were with that. But with cannabis, you see a higher association with addiction disorders. You also see, these are numbers from our clinics, the majority of people in our dual diagnosis ward um, for psychosis, it is, it's cannabis, natural, natural and synthetic. Definitely synthetic cannabis is the worst. So for us, we started down the path of looking at, um, when we were wanting to look at what are the developmental effects of cannabis, we looked at THC, and we looked at our rat model because we could control the amount of THC the animal was given during development. We didn't have to worry about their friends or their mothers being um, upset about them going to use uh, cannabis. And just, you know, what does the brain look like? That was our question, really. And when we looked in adult animals that had a lessened THC, we saw that showed that they did self-administer more heroin. Um, they're definitely... Uh, certain genetic and behavioral traits, um, caveats to that, even in rats, as there are in humans. But one of the things I said to one of my team members <laughs> finally was that, you know, we talk, say that we're studying cannabis, but actually we're studying THC. So at least let's look at the other cannabinoid, CBD. And at that time there was some indication that we knew that THC promoted psychosis in certain vulnerable people and CBD was starting to show that it perhaps had some antipsychotic properties. So in looking at that, we started looking at CBD. And so my postdoc at the time gave CBD to our rats, and we actually didn't see that it um, changed heroin self-administration when, when she gave it. And then the next day, she put the animals back into their, our self-administration box, and everyone is right, um, it's tough to show things without the, the, the pointer, but um, when it, um, some of the animals were not really engaged in self-administering heroin. So she thought she had done something wrong, it's like what happened? So this became our journey into studying CBD because what it turned out is that when animals self-administer um, heroin or any of the drugs when we're doing these uh, self-administration studies, for example, a cue light goes on in the environment, in, in their box, and when you show the cue light, for example, um, when, once they've learned and they're trained to get heroin, <laughs> and you just show the cue light, they start pressing the lever, searching for it. And we call it drug-seeking behavior, um, indica indicative of aspects of craving and so on. And when you show the cue light, that's what the animals were particularly um, paying attention to with the CBD, so that the CBD decreased their drug-seeking, <coughs> heroin-seeking behavior. And the thing that was even more fascinating was even two weeks after the last CBD that the animals received, and you put them back into their environment and show them the skew light, it still had an effect even though CBD was no longer in their body. So that became my journey of realizing that THC and CBD were not the same at all. And that even though we often see with both um, prenatal and adolescent exposure to THC that it enhanced sensitivity to um, here um, heroin self-administration, we see other uh, reward-related disturbances as adults, and especially sensitivity to stress, the CBD was doing the opposite. It was reducing um, drug-seeking behavior in particular. CC went over this yesterday. We have the same slide as well. Cannabidiol is complex. Um, we still don't really have a great handle on its mechanism of action. And 
as CC said, one of the things that I, I say as well, which is intriguing, is that normally pharmacologists, we love to, if something is up, let's get an, an antagonist, a hammer, and hit it down as hard as we can. If something is down, let's like try and boost it up. CBD is unique in that it tweaks little things in many different systems. And that might be one of the reasons why it, one, doesn't have this really terrible negative effects, and why it may be actually the way we should be looking at, not only for, um, we're talking about multiple disorders, but perhaps how we think about pharmacology in developing medicines in the future. But one of the things we do know is about what does the human brain look like when it has been exposed to heroin a lot. So I study, I do a lot of molecular biology work as well. Unfortunately, many people, as I said, die of opioid overdose, so my brain bank is filled predominantly with people who have died from heroin um, abuse. And we look in the brain and, um, of these people. In a, a brain region, for example, that we study a lot in addiction is the nucleus accumbens. It's really critical for reward, goal-directed behavior. The prefrontal cortex sends a lot of um, uh, terminals and regulates the, the striatum, the ventral striatum, the nucleus accumbens area. And from there, the, the cortex sends a lot of glutamatergic signaling. When you look in the brain of people who, have her who, are, who are heroin abusers, the thing that is clear is that there's huge disturbances of glutamatergic transmission. We, we studied um, just, uh, the genome, the transcriptome, meaning just unbiased for what gene we're looking at. And wherever, whenever we look, we see these genes that are related to synaptic plasticity that are impaired, and as I said, glutamatergic um, changes. So it's not the huge dopaminergic changes that I thought that we were going to see, or the, the even huge, um, uh, huge opioid changes. Um, we do see a significant endocannabinoid changes as well, but it's a lot with the, at the synapse. So what does CBD do? to the glutamatergic system. I'm showing you one particular receptor here. This is a classic AMPA receptor. And when animals self-administer heroin, they also, like the humans, show impairment of glutamatergic um, receptors, and CBD normalizes that. As I said, we also see impairments of the endocannabinoid system. This is CB1 receptor. Again, in animals that self-administer heroin, there's an impairment, and again, CBD normalizes that. So it's normalizing a number of the glutamatergic and synaptic plasticity related genes that we saw. So I then decided, even though we couldn't figure out the mechanism of action necessarily of CBD, of why it's acting, we saw that it reversed a few of the genes, and now we're doing a much bigger study and getting a much better insight into how CBD is um, inducing its, its effects in the brain. I wanted to see, does it really make a difference um, to the human <coughs> brain? Because we can do a lot of animal studies, and I do that a lot. I think the animal work is really critical. It can give us mechanistic insights that we can't get in, in humans. But I decided to do a crazy thing, because yes, I'm masochistic, to try to see if does cannabidiol work in, um, in people who might have heroin use disorder. So we first had to get FDA approval, IRB approval, try to write an NIH grant, convince a pharmaceutical company to give me the drug. And all of this, I have to say, I cried a lot, I begged a lot, and um, we finally got to do some of the clinical studies, and I'll just show you a few of them. You know, it's really tough to know time-wise. Um, sorry. Oh, I was talking really fast, okay. <laughs> I speak fast normally, but it's like I wanted to make sure we got through some of the things to get. Uh, so the first thing was that the FDA, um, so I, I wrote our protocol to look at drug-drug interaction because as a really great talk this morning emphasized, you know, it, the interactions are important, especially if we're trying to treat someone with an opioid use disorder and they relapse and they take an opioid and CYP3A um, does uh, metabolizes opioids and it's also a target for um, can, um, cannabidiol. So we 
um, had proposed looking at drug-drug interaction with morphine. The FDA said no. Yasmin, you have to use a much more potent opioid, and they forced us to use fentanyl. Um, and um, we actually saw no interactions. Granted, we still try to say stay low with our fentanyl, but we saw no interactions between um, CBD and um, and this potent opioid. We saw that the maximum peak of so this was um, we decided to go with. Um, I forgot to say, GW Pharmaceutical fi finally um, decided to, um, they got tired of my crying, yeah. and so they said, okay, Yasmin, we'll, we'll help you and give you, even though they weren't interested, and they still aren't interested in treating, um, developing a medication for an opioid use population. Um, they're committed to epilepsy, multiple sclerosis, but they decided, as I said, to help out. So I decided, I used, they made for me at that time capsules of 400, 400 milligrams and 800 was what I, I used. And we could, you can see that the, the, the pharmacokinetics here. And these were healthy subjects to start. And we didn't see anything related to anxiety or anything like that in the normal subjects um, or any change in mood at all. So after that, um, we then were able to get um, a small NIH grant, and for me, based on our animal work, we wanted to focus on craving because it is a key factor of relapse. All our, our patients will tell us that. Environmental cues, the stressors um, are a major trigger for craving, and obviously, you know, when they do take a drug, then when they lapse. So we started to look at this, and we did a pilot study to look at um, it was a double-blinded, placebo-controlled, and we look at people who were um, heroin depend um, had a heroin use disorder. They had to be abstinent. The beginning, we were like, okay, we need them to be abstinent for you know at least a month. That didn't really work. Um, so we wanted to make sure that they were not in acute withdrawal. So it was at least seven days, and we then did in, in laboratory Q-induced um, craving studies. I will say that. Um, it, I was also, again, naive because that study, we had to have people, we were using a particular um, clinical research unit at Mount Sinai, and we would do everything, and we had to start the study on a Monday. So I think that 90% of the people in this room, probably 99% of the people in this room will know what happened. We had to prep everybody, got all their clinical things, did everything. So everybody was set on Friday. Every patient wanted to participate. Trust me, everybody wanted to participate. And by Monday, what happened? <laughs> exactly, everybody relapsed. You know, so we, this study was, this became a pilot because practically they couldn't even start the first CBD. Um, and, but these are the results of the people who did finish. We showed them videos, and we showed them videos of neutral cues and heroin cues. And when you show some, a person who has a heroin use disorder, a heroin cue, they craved if they were getting the placebo. The CBD decreased that. One thing we hadn't studied in our animals, but our, the human subjects showed us, is that actually when they are craving, they show significant anxiety to the cues, and CBD decreased their, the, the cue-induced anxiety. And we brought people back a week later after the, after the, this was just a short acute um, uh, treatment, and then we did, we followed up for two more days of of CBD, and I should have mentioned one thing I forgot. The doses I chose were also based on our animal study. You know, people ask Yasmin, how did you get to that great, you know, doses because they, you know, they could show some effect. We, it's just translating. That's the dose that we had used in our rats, and we had treated our rats just like the first study was just three days with um, CBD, and we saw these great effects, and then we studied them weeks later. So we did the same thing with our participant. We, we treated them for three days with CBD um, after this first acute. This was day one. And then we brought them back, and a week later, just like our rats, craving was still decreased. So. Now comes the replication, and from now on, you, unfortunately, you can't um, take photos and tweet because it's in like the last phase of um, uh, 
we still haven't gotten it um, published, um, except it's in the last days of this uh, decision making that's gone on for a long time. But we, we decided to obviously run a replication study because the first one we didn't have a good enough sample. And this time, by now, I'm now the director of the Addiction Institute, so I can do the study where I want. So the moral of the story is become the director, so then you can run the study. And so we then didn't have to worry about a weekend effect or in things like that. So we did the same thing, and these are the results. It replicated. We see that CBD at both 400 and 800 milligrams, which equals about uh, 5 and 10 milligrams per kilo, decreases Q-induced craving. We studied the, the, day, uh, the day after as well, and we see that it still decreases craving. Just like the rats and the first study, bringing them back seven days later, it's still, their, their craving is still decreased. This is the anxiety, the same thing. There's a reduction of anxiety with Q-induced anxiety, um, and you see it also on the second day, and again, seven days later, it's still decreased. Thank you. This time around, we also did a lot of other measures, like physiological measures, and we measured like cortisol levels. And cortisol levels go up when you show um, when they're craving, and CBD decreases their Q-induced cortisol levels. It also, decreased, it also decreased their heart rate um, uh, that also is in, enhanced when they um, see um, the cues. And CBD decreases their heart rate response. So I do believe that cannabidiol holds promise for opioid use disorder, at least in aspects of craving and anxiety. There's a lot more that we need to do. We don't know the effective dose. Like I said, we just use a dose that we had started using in our animals. So, you know, is that the most effective dose? Also, the, the treatment regimen. We're just doing a few days of CBD. Well, one, I don't have enough money to, because we didn't have a, a big uh, budget for the grant. Now we, we're going to run a much bigger clinical trial, so that will be um, better. But, you know, how long, how much? Um, CBD over a particular time to get stable reduction of craving. The formulations for delivery. You know, I hear all the smoking and so on. Smoking is not a healthy form of any medicine. And if we're going to develop a medicine, we have to develop the formulations and delivery systems that ma maintain stable levels of these cannabinoids in the system. So, you know, for me, really want an urgency for clinical trials. Um, Multi-site studies, love to collaborate with all, any and all of you. And coming back to the definition of medicine, we keep, I keep hearing the word it's a medicine, but we have not shown that or proven that. My studies are small. There's no way that I would tell, you know, we would use this as a medicine in our clinic. It's still in the research phase. And thank goodness, Canada, you are our biggest experiment. So I can't wait, you know, so we need to make sure we do it together. So while this has happened, everybody has now made CBD the big fat. It's in our coffee, our drinks. It's even in hamburgers. It's in our, our face cream. It might work. I might have to get some. But, and even for the dogs. So wherever I go, everybody tells me, oh, it works for their dogs. So, you know, when we trivialize CBD to this level, we might miss an opportunity for something that can have true medicinal value. So that is one of the things I think we must be very cautious about. So I started with one wonder drug, and now we, we think that we have another wonder drug. There is no way that it can cure everything. So it's really important for us to really stay steadfast to what is medicine and really help patients and, and all of you to be able to know how to treat in a medically um, efficacious way. So thank you.